This conversation with Dr. Geet Chanani of LifeBridge Pakistan is the second in an audio series, Another Pakistan, recorded in midsummer 2011. It's a co production of the Watson Institute at Brown University and the Asia Society. I'm Christopher Leighton in Karachi with Dr. Geet Chanani. She's an American presence I hadn't counted on seeing in Pakistan. She was born in India, raised in New York, trained in the Caribbean. She's been practicing emergency medicine in the tent cities of the flooded Indus River in Pakistan for most of a year now. This is open source from the Watson Institute at Brown University, a South Asian conversation this summer of 2011 with some American attitude. We met almost by chance, Dr. Chinani, in the Do Good Network of Karachi. But there's an American story here and a vision of Yanks at their best, our trans nation at home in the world, that I wanted to get down. You're an American who came home, so to speak, to India and then to this old province of Sindh. How did this happen? We are Sindhi. Our family roots are Sindhi. Uh, Growing up, our identity was always reinforced and over-enforced and brought home to us very, very early in our lives that we are Sindhi first, before we are Indian or anything else. So This was the world once upon a time. I mean, it's the the mouth of the Indus River. It's where, in so many ways, civilization, certainly Indian civilization, began, right? Yes. Absolutely. Indian civilization definitely began here. Uh, everything that I have experienced after coming here, after visiting Mohenjo-Daro, and then you see that there is plumbing system there in place, mm. as in a sewage and a drainage system in place, that they don't even have in the villages today, here in Sindh. Um, not just in Sindh, in parts of India too, that mm. I have visited. They don't have that sophisticated a system. So... It's been, it's been a fascinating experience, and, and coming back here was all about that. It, w- it was all about tracing and going back to my roots as an Indian and as a Sindhi, um, both. I was fascinated by the Indus Valley civilization at a very early, early age. Um, what about as an American, as a New Yorker? You sound so New York. I am very New York. My identity about New York, <laughs> but my identity as an American is, 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 is very much a part of me and I think is the ground for the work. That I do, um, the the fundamental belief that all men are created equal. You know, it's in our it's in our is it the preamble? Hmm. <laughs> um, Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> it's there, and and I believe in it completely, one hundred percent. The equality that we have in America is unsurpassed anywhere. Men and women, religious tolerance, you know, human rights. Everything we have in America is just it's amazing. And the fact that we can, and it's such a huge melting pot with so many different people from so many different places coming in and not feeling like they're not at home. Was this your first trip to Sindh? Yes, absolutely. You get here and the floodwaters have hit the fan. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it all happened by, a, I, I don't know. You know, it's like that saying, well, you picked Sindh and you're saving these people. And I'm like, no, uh, it picked me and they're saving me. That's what it feels like. Uh, just walk us through those first days. You landed. I landed. Um, but I happened to land here in the middle of the flood. And one of my friends, a very close friend of mine, who is actually my roommate now, um, is a humanitarian aides. What, it was a humanitarian officer for UNOCHA um, and is now working as program head for a local organization, a local NGO. And um, they do sustainable livelihood projects. And she, the villages, their target villages, their focus villages, were actually affected by the flood. So she, she told me about this. And she said, listen, we're doing site visits to see what the situation's like. Do you want to visit? Hmm. Do you want to come with me? I said, all right. So on the way there, we're going. It's a good six and a half, seven hour journey by road um, from Karachi to Sakhar. So we're going and she's, you know, basically bringing me up to speed about the situation, who's visited, what's been going on, whatever, whatever. And her, again, her focus is dominantly humanitarian aid, as in everything other than medical. So she's been telling me, okay, they're getting food, they're getting da 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 and I'm like, all right, great. And they've, she's done a pretty damn good job, you know, as far as that little tent city is concerned. They have clean water. They have um, a good amount of food coming in. Um, 
they but but the needs are so high because mm. these families are not tiny they're not four and five people families they're 11 people families mm. where there's two parents well obviously a mother father and usually one elder and somewhere between seven and nine children mm. so these are large large families that need have a lot of mouths to feed anyway i get in there and um i'm walking around now my first what i've been told is that there's visit, visiting medical services and there was somebody there just three days ago or two days ago what i what i understood from that was that there was somebody that was coming and seeing them um diagnosing them and then obviously treating them that's how it goes right so that's what I assumed she meant when she said visit, visiting medical services. So, and, th- and that was not cleared. That w- it wasn't clarified. So I don't know if that was my fault or her fault, but it wasn't something that was clarified. And I, again, didn't know that I would be getting involved. It was more of a kismet, if you will, kind of mm. situation. So I, I ended up um, there and I'm walking around and the, she gets out of her, the Jeep comes in. And um, it, it parks, she gets out of the car, and she's in her world, her, her field officers. This is her place. So her field officers are there, everybody's there, all the people know that she's the head guy to go to um, if they want tents. And if they, and, and they would, the, the demand was just, you couldn't fulfill it. it demand was so for what bad. at that point? Um, tents, rations, everybody wanted to be a part of your tent city. And you only had a certain amount of uh, resources. You know, you only had a certain amount of tents. You only had a certain amount of Russian that you could give out. Her priority was to look after the villages that were her focus villages. Now there were people coming from other parts that were wanting to be a part of that tent city. Um, there was a, a, a seven to eight million people that were affected solely in, in Sindh. Hmm. And did we have that kind of uh, aid available in Sindh? No, we didn't. I want to hear when it first kicked in for you or for them that this was something rather extraordinary. An American doctor who speaks our language and uh, seems to care. Okay, the experience that that my initial experience was, how it started was, um, I'm out in Sint. I am looking at this whole experience for the first time. I have not really interacted with anybody, and my here's my friend who has been doing this for ten years, and we're in a tent city that's hers, her focus villages, and she has been working with these people for quite some time now, six to eight months. And she's trying to communicate with this woman. Um, the, one of the dominant problems of Sindh is, and I believe this is why their problems are so uh, aren't voiced enough, is because they don't they have a language barrier, a very huge language barrier within in Sindh. Pakistan, even. Yes, within Pakistan, even because they refuse to speak anything other than Sindhi. So, for example, Karachi people are Urdu speaking; they speak dominantly Urdu. So my friend is Urdu speaking, although she lives in a province of, she lives in the province of Sindh. She's not a Sindhi speaking yeah. um, person. So she goes into Sindh and she's talking to this woman. This woman speaking to her in Sindhi. She understands her completely, but she starts to respond to her in Urdu. The woman is looking at her and she's like, hmm. And then she turns, she looks at me and she says to me in our language in Sindhi, I have no idea what the hell this woman is saying. And I'm looking at her, and I, I couldn't help but smile. And so my friend looks at me, and she says, what the hell are you doing? Bop, you know? Speak to the woman and tell her what I'm trying to say. And for me, this is, I'm like completely out of my element at this point. Hello, I'm an American. Yes, I speak Cindy, but I don't know what I'm doing here, you know? And so I'm like, hmm, okay. So then I started talking to this woman. That was the first experience I had. And um, I was like, wow. I in, immediately... Instantly, I basically replaced somebody that's Pakistani, born and raised, in an instant, just because of the language. And that has been the case ever since. I do not, you know, a lot of people feel like security issues, um, oh, travel at night, and my God, you know. And I'm not saying that that's all hype. I, I know that I hear about it in the news all the time. Is it my experience every single day? No. You know, these people are extremely protective. These people do not, they look at me and they don't refer to me as doctor or some missus. No, they call me the Cindy word for sister, Adi. Mm. As soon as they see me, that's all the Adi, Adi, Adi. It means sister. And the minute that, and they take that very seriously, that they're calling me their sister. Mm. So that means now that they are going to protect me as their sister. And I've been welcomed in so many different ways. You know, people say things like Hindu and Muslim. And um, again, not that it's not a reality. It has to be. I mean, we hear about it all the time. Is it my reality? No, it hasn't been. I mean, I have been asked, well, what are your roots? 
And so I'll be like, and the terminology that they use in Sindh for Hindus is div- divan. That's mm-hmm. how they term Hindus. And I've been asked, so uh, what's your name? Geet Chanani. Okay, so that makes you, and they look at me. And then I'm like, hmm. And then they go, divan. And I'm like, yep, you know, and that's it. And then they're like, wow. I have gotten either silence completely or I've gotten, oh my God, you're the lost divans of Sindh. <laughs> You've come back. <laughs> During the partition, the Hindus dominantly left and went to India. Um, something that you'll see that's very common in the Sindhi diaspora, Hindu Sindhi diaspora, is that they are they are dispersed. They're not just in India. They are all over the world. They're in St. Martin. They're all over the Caribbean. They're in Spain. They're in pff, Malaysia and hmm. Bangkok. Everywhere. Everywhere. Thailand. I want to hear the doctor-patient encounter as you've experienced it. Okay. Uh, one majority of the cases that we've dealt with are simple. Please remember that. These are very simple cases that were blown out of proportion because of the limited resources and access and just dirty water. Um, one was a little girl, and uh, she came to me. Her mom brought her to me, and the child was beyond uncomfortable, crying and just cranky and just not happy and whatever and I couldn't see why it was because she wasn't facing me directly she was uh, her mother was holding her and she was facing away from me so the affected side I couldn't see so the mother brings her and she she says okay my daughter's really sick and blah blah blah. Uh, she's not feeling well she's been very cranky and then she turns her and she says see she's got this on her eye the girl's eye was swollen shut and it was all pussed up and I looked at it and I said wow a simple eye infection and this child is going to lose her eye because they just don't have anything else to, you know, they don't have access to anything. So I sat her down and in that situation, now I am sitting in a tent city. There is no light. There is um, no access to clean water. There, everything is being done very ad hoc. There's no fans. Uh, We had one little uh, after about an hour or two hours of being there, somebody had managed to pull an electric line and be able to light a little light bulb on top of me so I could see. But I needed flashlights to see these situations, the, these cases that were presenting up close. I, I, had to see, I had to be able to see it properly, like her eye, for example. So I'm looking at the child and I'm like, okay, now what do I do? Because there's no clean water. <laughs> uh, how am I supposed to clean her eye and things like that, you know? So immediately, of course, you, you start, ad hoc situation is where you start kind of making things happen from what you have. And this was my experience from point one, because I didn't go there prepared to see patients. Mm. I went there with a stethoscope in my bag, and that was it. Um, and that, too, just more out of, na- more out, more out of habit than out of, oh, I'm going to do something, you know? Um, so when I went there, it was, it was it, 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 anyway, when I was seeing this girl, I'm like, all right, how do I do this? Because um, I, I don't have anything and blah, blah. So I see a, 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 a small jar of saline. And I'm like, oh, there we go, sterile. I can actually use that to clean her eye. So I cut it open and used the saline to clean her eye up. And then um, I spent a good you know, 10 minutes cleaning her eye and taking the muck out. It was all yucky. And then after that, uh, she was very uncomfortable. She was in pain. But I, I managed to get the medicine in her eye, in, in between. There was like a little crease between her eyelids. And I got the medicine in, and then I packed it up and I, so that the dirt wouldn't go anymore in her eyes. And so I, I packed it up, and I bandaged her, and I said to her mom, make sure she doesn't take this off. She's going to try because she's a little baby. But at least an hour or two, try to make sure that, you know, keep an eye on her and make sure that she doesn't take it off, keep her entertained with something else. And sure enough, you know, she kept it on for like three, four hours apparently after they went home. The next day the baby comes back and her eye is half open. Hmm. It was one of those little, little tiny, tiny miracles that you see. And I was like, okay, good. You know, like something so simple. And this girl was, I don't even think she was two years old yet. You know, and and she was going to lose her eye. And there was a boy there that had actually lost his eye from a similar eye infection that he had when he was a child. Uh, Obviously he was too old now. But it it had happened to him where he had lost vision completely in his right eye. Uh, So that was one case. And then over two days and three days, it actually resolved. The eye was down to 25% of what I saw it um, when I, the last time I saw the patient. And um, which was a good experience. You know, that was definitely something that felt nice. 
The other, the other so obvious question is, what if the United States were sending doctors and nurses and smart people with stethoscopes instead of Marines, much less the drones? <laughs> I think that it would eventually end up making the country better. I can say that the country is in dire need of health care, of public health. It's not just doctors. We have organizations that are here, but we have a serious problem with communicating with these people. If you're coming into Sindh and you're going to, and I can speak only about Sindh. I'm sure this is actually the case everywhere else too. But if you're coming into Sindh, please make sure that you know how to speak the language. Not that you know how to speak the language necessarily, but you have somebody that does. Somebody that's on board, that's with you regularly, that is the person that, that is making sure what the intervention is and is in charge of health and hygiene awareness. Like, coming in and, and, and giving out vaccines is great, but if these people don't know what the hell the purpose of that is, it doesn't serve the purpose in the long run. You know, that, that is a big thing. They have a fear factor of a lot of things. They don't know what's going on. So they would rather, because they don't understand it, they would rather deal with getting hepatitis than actually getting the injection. You know, simple things like that. Yeah. I mean, people have died over here because of those kind of things. There is a certain amount of shoddiness that's happened here mm. in Sindh. Doctors, there's a deficit of doctors available. Because there are no doctors, there are dispensers that are taking their place. Do, are doc dispensers trained to, um, to actually take care of these kind of things, to treat patients? No. They're not trained. They, all they know how to do is give out medicine. So simple things like they won't use fresh, sterile needles. They won't. They'll use the same needle on, the same, on 15 patients and then spread the disease. There's actually a village in Largana, in Sindh, where 100% of the population has hepatitis C. Why? Because there was a dispenser there that never used a clean needle. He just used it in one patient and then kept using the same needle over and over again. Now they have a fear factor. That is obviously going to cause a fear factor from needles and things like that. Yeah. And they have fears. They're afraid. They don't understand. They, they're very wary of people that they, don't, they can't communicate with. And you're coming with like a needle and they don't know what you're doing to them. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's like, okay. So yeah, I think the communication factor is huge, but it needs it. Just in case I missed it, Dr. Geek Chainani, what's the message you're sending home? To us Americans. <laughs> Humanity first. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ben Mandelkern produced this conversation in Karachi with Dr. Geet Chanani, country director of LifeBridge Pakistan. Henry Peck edited it. Our series, Another Pakistan, is a co-production of the Watson Institute and the Asia Society. Zarmine Ansari is our producer in Pakistan. Thanks also to Bina Sarwar of the Jung Media Group. The conversations continue from South Asia and also online. Listeners, please feed back your views, your Pakistan, with a comment on our website, radioopensource.org. I'm Christopher Leiden. Thank you for being part of the Open Source Conversation.